When they moved into London with their guns and their drugs, Scotland Yard grasped at one of the most dangerous weapons in their armory. They used murderous gangsters as informants. Tonight, World in Action uncovers the hidden story of a secret police operation which set out to defend the law and ended up by bending it. This is the story of a war fought out on the streets of our cities. It is a story about the vicious Yardi criminals who deal crack and murder on our streets and about the informants the police use to catch them. It is a story in which a multiple murderer escaped prosecution and in which a lethally dangerous gunman was allowed to stay illegally in this country where he raped and murdered. Above all, it is a story about the line between right and wrong and about the disastrous results of law officers straying across it. The story begins in the late 1980s when Scotland Yard realised that they were facing a new threat. Jamaican gangsters known as Yardies were moving into London, pumping huge quantities of crack cocaine onto the streets and using violence in a routine, almost casual way, shooting and kidnapping and torturing those who stood in their way. And unlike the more familiar mafias, the Yardies had no formal structure, which made it much more difficult to find out what they were doing. It was a new problem, but Scotland Yard fell back on an old solution, informers. The first wave of officers who confronted the Yardies understood the dangers of trying to use them as informers. Well, it's necessary to use informants to deal with most kinds of crime, and it always has, has been so. I mean, informants go back thousands of years, I guess. Former Superintendent John Jones won a reputation in the 1980s as one of the Met's best Yardie hunters. Informants have always been used by the police, dealing with all kinds of crime. Uh, in the case of the Jamaicans, uh, the Jamaican criminals, that is, they are from a different culture by and large from the culture which we live in here and therefore it's much more difficult for the police to, if you like, infiltrate in a more general way the community which they hide amongst. The people that you're trying to catch are nasty and sometimes the people and the methods indeed that you have to use to catch them are nasty. As head of serious crime in Nottingham, Peter Coles knew at first hand the dirty world of the informant. It should always be the police who are in control of the informants. Unfortunately, it's, it is not uncommon for the informant to actually be in control of the police officer. The use of informants to fight the violence of the Yardi gangs may have been understandable, but a number of episodes over the last three years suggests that Scotland Yard's informant-based anti-Yardi operation has been seriously and repeatedly compromised. At the centre of this story of chaos were two men who had never been trained for this work and who were allowed to operate with the minimum of supervision. One was an immigration officer, Brian Fotheringham. Fotheringham had no specialised training and few resources. The other was an ordinary police constable named Steve Barker, who'd been pounding the beat in South London. Barker had stumbled into the war against the Yardies when he persuaded one key man to become his informer. Suddenly, he was moved to the front line to Scotland Yard's intelligence department, SO11. Barker and Fotheringham fought the Yardies on the streets of London. They sorted out the moral and legal tangles as they went along. Trouble was not far away. One of PC Barker's informants was Delroy Denton, 
known on the streets as Epsi. Denton arrived in this country illegally in 1993 and was recruited as an informant after being arrested in a raid on a Brixton pub. He worked for Scotland Yard for two years, providing information on other Jamaican criminals. But after two years, Denton was jailed for life for the murder of 24-year-old Marcia Laws. Marcia's sister Mercy is now looking after her two young children, Cassius and Malika. They're babies still. Cassius is three and a half, Malika's um, 27 months. And so they don't really know too much about Marcia, but, you know, they know her. They're the fruit, um, talking about her, showing them pictures, things like that. And with all this happening, Cassius has picked up on certain things and he's realised that, you know, something's happened to his mum. He, um, the other day, he asked me, you know, why has she gone to heaven? And I said, oh, because she just died. And he said, no, the man beat her up. Well, I think we all feel really very angry because we know it shouldn't have happened in the first place. We know that it shouldn't have been in the country. Mm. It, sh it sh just shouldn't have happened in the first place. You know, we obviously we're really angry because it, it could have been prevented. Denton's information may have been valuable in the fight against the Yardies, but giving him his freedom as an informer had a terrible price. What sort of a man was this? Law enforcement officials relied on him for information, yet he could murder the mother of two small children. Down at Central Police Station in Kingston, Jamaica, Delroy Denton is well known. Two officers from the Jamaican Constabulary dug out his criminal file from their records department. I know him as a gunman. I know him as a hardened gunman. And he's very witty. Very, 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 very witty. He's what I would call a silent killer. He will creep upon you at any moment, kill you, and no one knows. When we told Sergeant Thompson that Scotland Yard had recruited Denton as an informer, he stressed the need for Denton's handlers to control him. It will be very, very important because, as I said before, um, he has a wide knowledge of what is going on, and what He's a person you cannot take him too lightly. You will have to have somebody else keeping an eye on him. In May 1994, in London, Brian Fotheringham found himself sitting across the interview table from Delroy Denton, who had been arrested with a knife in a drugs raid on a Brixton pub. Brian Fotheringham knew a lot about his interviewee from police intelligence files. The illegal immigrant was a founder of a Jamaican Yardi posse and had fought in street wars there. His record in Kingston included a 16-year sentence for firearms offences and armed robbery. Denton was a very dangerous individual, Fotheringham noted on the file, and he underlined the word very. He filled in another document, an exceptional risk form. This was to alert Scotland Yard to the presence of this dangerous man. It described him as being of an extremely violent nature. Fotheringham considered Denton so dangerous that when the Jamaican applied for political asylum here, Fotheringham was certain that he should stay behind bars while the application was handled. Long-term detention was required. Then an odd thing happened. Brian Fotheringham had a conversation with Constable Steve Barker from the Yardie unit at SO11. And Fotheringham changed his mind. 
Denton no longer seemed to be dangerous. Fotheringham noted, PC Barker has stated, intelligence has shown the subject has not been involved in any serious criminal matters since being here. After consulting a more senior immigration officer, Fotheringham concluded there was no realistic chance of detaining Denton for long. Denton could be released after all while his asylum claim was handled. But there was one thing Brian Fotheringham did not record in his notes. That day, Delroy Denton had agreed to work as an informer, both for Fotheringham and for Steve Barker. And that night, this very dangerous individual was allowed to walk out of custody and back onto the streets of London. Some of Denton's closest associates were none too pleased to see him. They knew he was deeply disturbed. They had heard him boasting about the girl he had throttled in a phone box and about another woman whose throat he had cut. And now he was free again. A lot of the sort of police officers who, who um, identify themselves uh, as being good at handling informants tend to be fairly young and inexperienced because they're full of enthusiasm. They're actually out on the street. They're dealing with the sorts of crimes which lead them to uh, be able to build up a, a, a bank, if you like, of informants. But they haven't necessarily got the kind of wisdom which is very, very vital in, in one's dealings with an informant. They probably don't always understand, as they should, how dangerous these people are. And sometimes the, the, the vision of what they may obtain from the informant blinds them to the dangers which they're putting themselves and sometimes other people in. Seven months after Denton was released, the mother of a 15-year-old convent schoolgirl called the local police to say that her daughter had been raped. The girl described how she and three friends had got to know a man they sometimes saw on their way home from school. That day, they had skipped school and gone round to his flat. He had behaved in such a crazy way that they'd called him screw loose. They drank some wine and smoked a joint, and she had fallen asleep. Her friends had left, and she'd woken up to find the man forcing himself upon her. His name was Delroy Denton. Denton was arrested and remanded in custody, though he denied the rape, saying the girl had consented. The girl herself was admitted to hospital on the day after the rape, having taken an overdose of sleeping pills. Two months later, the Crown Prosecution Service dropped the charges against Denton on the grounds of insufficient evidence. But still time, perhaps, to revisit Fotheringham's original view of Denton as very dangerous. We've discovered that five months earlier, the Jamaican's asylum application had been refused. For Delroy Denton, deportation could not be far away. But then, an unfortunate thing happened. Denton's immigration file had been marked for dispatch to Fotheringham for a final round of inquiries, and it had disappeared. Denton was back on the streets of London. By April 1995, deportation was on no one's agenda. Denton was still reporting to Fotheringham's office and still working for Scotland Yard. And 24-year-old Marcia Laws, the mother of two small children, went missing. I was sort of preparing myself for something. I sort of, you know, shipped my little boy off to a friend's house for the weekend. Um, phoned up another friend to say, look, this something's happened to Marcia, whatever happens, we're going to phone the police or kick the door down, because the house was just dark all the time. No one's seen her type of thing, and then just getting into the house, seeing her there, you know, sort of, so I, I, obviously I did scream a little bit, and then sort of just stopped, uh, wait for, I remember wanting, wanting the ambulance to hurry up, Knowing, even knowing that she was dead, I just wanted them to hurry up, to take her out of there. It was horrible that she'd been there for, you know, God knows how many days. Denton was arrested and charged, 
But after four months in custody, the Crown Prosecution Service decided there was insufficient evidence to gain a conviction. They dropped the case. It was a decision that incensed the local murder squad. They knew Denton was an illegal immigrant and that his claim to asylum had been refused at the Home Office. So they asked Brian Fotheringham to detain him. Fotheringham refused. Denton was released onto the street again and Fotheringham and Scotland Yard continued to use him as an informant. The murder squad investigating Marcia's murder knew Denton was their man and they reactivated the case. They found more evidence, re-arrested Denton and charged him again with the murder of Marcia Laws. In July last year, Delroy Denton was jailed for life. Fotheringham has been questioned by his bosses about the decision to release Denton and how the immigration service could have failed to serve the papers that could have saved two women from his violence. Fotheringham insisted the file had been lost. We spoke to David Burrell, former inspector with the Immigration Services Law Enforcement Unit, about the legal position. Mr Burrell, once an asylum application letter has been written and an application rejected, how common would it be for that letter to sit around at immigration for a period of months? Most uncommon, almost unheard of, I would say. So how concerned would you have been at, at such a failure, such a delay? Extremely concerned, because once received, the immigration office is under a duty to make arrangements for that person's removal from the country. Brian Fotheringham denies that he has ever helped a Yardi informer to stay illegally in the UK. But a man who has worked closely with him has told us that such arrangements can be made. There was an unwritten policy of cooperation between the police and the immigration service. That's the kind of understanding you get when people work closely together. We relied on the police for our existence. We want the police to make our arrests. We want police cells to hold people in custody. We need police interview rooms. In return, there are certain things that go on. Well, one way of helping the police was you could ignore a situation. You could sit on a file and turn a blind eye. The agreements were made that a file would remain halfway down the pipeline. It was all based on trust. I have no doubt that from time to time uh, arrangements are made unofficially to allow his detention by the Immigration Service to be delayed for a little while. And speaking pragmatically, and, and as an ex-police officer rather than as a current one, I, I, I see nothing wrong with that idea, provided it's carried out in a responsible way. There have been wider problems with Scotland Yard's Yardie operation. Three times in four years, separate squads were set up, and three times in four years, the squads were shut down before they could finish the job. One Jamaican killer was imported into the UK, given a luxury flat and car, and entertained by officers at the local golf range. The cost? About £30,000. The return? According to a senior source, not a single arrest. Another Yardi informant came in on a six-month visa and stayed for ten years. He was eventually jailed for armed robbery. And then there was the case of Eton Green. Green was Constable Barker's other star informant. In 1993, while working for Scotland Yard, Green was arrested by the Nottingham police for leading a massive robbery on a blues party held in this warehouse on the outskirts of the city. For a time, Peter Coles was in charge of the investigation. During the early hours, a gang of um, men came in. Um, they announced uh, that they were, the, I think, believe it was the Seek and Destroy posse, uh, fired some shots and, in fact, shot one man in the leg and uh, proceeded to rob most of the people present of um, money, watches, rings, etc. And, and a huge number of people actually got robbed at gunpoint and were terrified by it. At the warehouse robbery trial, Green turned Queen's evidence and helped convict his Yardie accomplices. 
Green was eventually sentenced to six years in prison. But in court it emerged that when Nottingham officers had begun investigating Green, Scotland Yard had impeded them. Scotland Yard had failed to pass on to Nottingham information which would have been helpful in their investigation. And at a time when Nottingham detectives had asked for Scotland Yard's help in arresting Green, Steve Barker, his handler, had met with Green and allowed him to walk away. And then, in violation of Home Office rules, Scotland Yard's officers had misled the court about Green's role as an informant. In his summing up, Mr Justice Smedley reserved his harshest words for Scotland Yard. I am very disturbed at the way in which those responsible for handling Mr Green appear not only to have failed to cooperate, but possibly to have impeded Nottingham's inquiries. I think the general feeling left was that um, they had been obstructed in a way that they didn't expect fellow police officers to obstruct them. I think, that would, I think the officers that were actually hands-on by the time of the trial would uh, agree with that sentiment. The story gets stranger. Shortly after his conviction, Green was taken out of prison to a Metropolitan Police safe house. There, he agreed to become a supergrass. He made a detailed confession of his life of crime. In the process, Green admitted to committing 11 murders in Jamaica. He also described a series of violent crimes carried out in London while he was being paid as an informer. The way that Green's extraordinary confession has been handled raises serious questions about Scotland Yard's anti-Yardie operation. To start with, Scotland Yard have never told the Jamaican police. Nor has Green been prosecuted for the violent crimes he admitted in London. In the debriefing, quite deliberately, he was never cautioned because they feared he'd clam up. His admissions could not be used against him. Scotland Yard simply kept the confessions of a multiple killer and armed robber to themselves. It is very, very surprising to me as a police officer because it is a fundamental rule of policing. It's not something that, you know, it's not a clever rule. It's one of the very, very first things that you are taught that a person who is suspected of committing an offence, or indeed in this case is admitting an offence, has to be cautioned. It's, it's not, it, it's just not something, it is second nature to any policeman. If he suddenly comes out with stuff they don't expect, particularly about serious crime like that, well, you, you know, you've just got no option. You, you know, you, you may not want to do it because it might stop him talking, but uh, you have to do it. Despite Green's confessions to murder and random violence, Scotland Yard now set about easing his way back onto the streets of London. They sent a report to the parole board outlining his value as an informant and they approached the Home Office to try to stop him being deported. But would he carry on robbing and shooting as he had done in his previous career as an informer? There seemed no way of knowing, although a parole assessment report suggested Green should take part in anger management sessions after his release. Nobody knows how many Yardies have been allowed into the country by Scotland Yard, nor how many crimes they have gone on to commit. It's clear that rules have been broken and laws have been bent in an operation whose senior management appears to have been in a state of some confusion. Neither Scotland Yard nor the Immigration Department are willing to discuss what they've done. The victims have been left alone, without any explanation, trying to come to terms with what's happened to them.